section uh, on uh, some interesting things in mitral valve surgery. So our first speaker is our, our beloved friend and colleague and panel member this meeting, uh, Tawasak Chodpong. Um, and Tawasak's going to be talking about managing uh, extensive calcification in rheumatic valvular disease. Thank you very much, Ove. Uh, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I am so glad that at finally we can come to this uh, meeting, the concrete gets started with excellent start. And now I'm going to talk on the repairing of the extensive calcified rheumatic mitral valve. And I have nothing to disclose. I think that we have to, to, to say that the rheumatic valve repair, the goal is the same. Like in degenerative valve is to restore the no normal mitral dynamic. Only that we have to stress something. We are going to just restore both the diastolic and systolic as well. Because diastolic is one part that is badly affected. And then the, the, when we talk about the meaning of that, does mean there must be some uh, normal movement of the mitral leaflet, which is actually is the quadric leaflet, the anterior and the posterior and both commissural leaflet. And then one of the most very challenging uh, problem in rheumatic is First, if we can divide for start from commission, usually they are fusion. And when they proceed for long, there will have some calcifications. And not is just that. Calcification is just the is is just the iceberg of the several pathology. That is the leaf is usually thickened, retracted, and even calcified. And the subval is also very severely affected, fusion shortened. And there's some elongation, but mostly are thickened. And the analyst is fibrous, deformed, or dilatation and calcified. So to, to do that, uh, I think we need some two sparks in order to tackle all of these very complex structure and problem. Commissiotomy is the key. We have to fully open first. Otherwise, we cannot assess the mobility. And then it's very uh, facilitated by papillotomy, caudal splitting, and finestation. We have to stress because there's a big issue in rheumatic when the cord are fused and then block the diastolic and impair the movement of the leaflet. Leaflet thinning has become uh, popularized that it can really restore the pliability and mobility. Augmentation sometimes is needed. Calcium. Now we know that we can decalcify and then provide a very no, uh, a large percentage of the normal tissue beneath the calcification. Quarter repair now with cortex, uh, resection, shortening, transfer, and the aneroplasty is one key thing that we have to think about the, the dynamic of pathology that we have to remodel it back and restore the framework for the normal mitral valve to function. And the, the calcium now is the main issue that we are going to talk. Calcium is the real calcification is the full layer. Usually it's maybe full layer. If it's full layer, we have to resect and then we do the tissue repair. But most of the time, when you first see it, you think that it's a full layer. So actually, large percentage of them are partial thickness. In this aspect, we can decalcify and then we can peel it, peel the calcium, peel the tissue, and then you do some tissue repair if needed. Subvalve is must almost always for the severely calcified valve. And then caudal fusion, papillotomy or finestation is become the key. Resection of any res restrictive cord or obstructive cord is the key that to not to restore the normality of the movement of the leaflet. And the leaflet uh, tissue defect, when this happens, tissue repair is needed either when with uh, autologous pericardium or bovine pericardium. And then one of the key things that I would like to get started is the commissure. Sometimes it's very difficult to find and uh, the line of the commissure. The, the trick is that the, the two fixed part is the, 
the tricone that we have put now you can see the dimple of the tricone a few millimeter below that is the starting point is the level of the commissure five three to five minutes of millimeter is the starting point to cut into the center part then in this way usually we can restore the normal commissurotomy without uh, too much injury to the subvalve structure and then we can provide the full mobility and opening of the valve leaflet. Now, when you do that, there's a key thing about the resections. And uh, when you when 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 talk about a resection, usually we talk about resection of the section E cord. And we think about the only restricted restriction, which is true. But it's not whole truth. It is obstruct as well. And this idea I got it from Patrick uh, during our discussion briefly. Do you remember that you talked? It's not just only restrict, but obstruct the liver from moving down. That open the door of thinking. So any cord that is thick and shortened is not only restrict, but obstruct, and then block the full opening of the liver. So we need to cut it out, cut first, and then we restore back into type one later. So you cut, cut, cut like this, and all of these are cut. It is primary. We cut as well, and then we store it back. And then this cut will restore the normal normality of angulation and then make it normal popping up and then provide a good quartation later. And then this is something that we now know and then we are quite aggressive to do that. And this, the ring aneroplasty is also something that we have to think. Uh, what type of the ring or band or complete or semi-rigid or rigid? If the key is that if it's um, the purpose is to stabilize, to remodel, to prevent further dilatation, and to correct any deformity. And the type is that the more complex, the more dilated, complete ring is much better than the band because it's stronger. And when it's more, subval more fibrosis uh, rigid, it's more better than semi-rigid. And the more caudal resection more is, is more need for ring to, for better coaptation because it can compensate for any resected secondary cord that hold the strength during the systolic uh, dynamic. So this is something I would like to show some of the, the video. This is a severe calcified mitral stenosis. So the rule we first, we have to do the full commissurotomy first, starting from the mid part. And now we can see the calcium is really extensive. Even the, the sharp blade cannot cut it sometimes. But with persistence, we can slowly fire the plane and do the commissurotomy down to the papillary muscle. And then slowly the calcium, we can slowly find the way how to chop it out and then open the fused uh, papillary muscle. And the this one then, we can see that each cut, it will restore the mo normal mobility back. And the peeling is something we now do as a routine and starting from the hinge part toward the rough zone. And usually this mean in the posterior leaflet, we can go about half in the anterior, we can go about two thirds of the leaflet. Slowly, we can go and along to the commissure and you can see that we have now modified the peeling, trying to peel the calcium out by trying to find the plane. And using the blunt re, uh, dissection between, and usually done by the surgeon alone because the feeling, that's why I asked the Rudiger about the tactile. This is a real part of the tactile sensation in this uh, surgery. We have to feel if and go, let go, and then combine with sharp resection with a sharp point, sharp point only, one by one. I call this technique the sniper technique. You put it out, you cut it. You're not going to use the machine gun to f create the false layer. By this slowly, you can find a real plane. Going down, and then the whole calcium slowly coming out like this, and then uh, using combine with the scissor, and start stop at the rough zone, and then we can trim smooth surface so that the coaptation become better. 
And then coming back to this, you can see that slowly the chunk of the thick and calcified layer is slowly become to peel off. Layer that we put in the ring, we can restore not too bad without that with the normal mortality, mobility like this. Now, now if, if it's something like this one, this one has happened in, the, in quite a quite young people who have uh, been doing uh, previous, it's quite stiff, the tissue, then the same thing that you have to start by the uh, commissioner, that means slowly trying to recreate the fan shape at the commissioner because now we know the fan shape provide the movement of the small commissioner leaf that which will provide fully opening and, and very <coughs> stable closing. Using the chop dissection, uh, we can recreate this fenestration. This is the fuse of the uh, caudal part that we, this actually block the passage of the flow during, from the LA to the LV, LV during the diastole. When we open it, it will provide the alternative passage of flow that can reduce the mean gradient across the mitoval. And then when we finish that, you can see that the very stiff and fibrosis and calcified of the tissue that we can slowly, actually we can almost always can peel it up to the, this level. And then we put it in, this gives you a really good smile with this low gradient because now the flow can go across this finestrated channel. And this part, now I'm going to show you this ugly one. This is a very quite ugly that sometimes when it's too severe and involves the whole pericard, the whole thickness, sometimes we have to employ the use of the pericardium. But uh, with all of this I mentioned technique, uh, the need of the tissue repair by the pericardium is now reduced and the amount, the quantity is reduced, which is greatly good, especially in the young patient. Uh, when we do that, you can see that when sometimes we have to combine with these, when the calcium is very really severe, we have to combine with the sharp dissection as well. And then slowly we can put these chunks it out. In the past, we just be able to do this during the last five years. In the past, we have to chop it out and use a lot of pericardium, use a lot of cortic, which is good, but uh, sometimes it's is a problematic if the patient is young. So we try to preserve the use of this uh, uh, material uh, so that we can achieve long-term result. Uh, and slowly like this is almost over this seem to be in impossible to uh, repair valve is gradually become piece by piece, step by step, advanced to get rid of this uh, calcify and severely uh, pathology that restrict the movement of the leaf that and opening, uh, both the opening and the closing. You can see that at the end, in this part, in this patient, we have to use the tissue and uh, at the C2 and P3, which is small and very easily to, to reconstruct because of it, we, we have uh, combined the technique that I I told you before, and then closing all of this small cleft uh, tissue defect, and then we put in the ring, and everything seems to be okay. You see that? Yeah, this ugly valves coming back, and uh, give you the very satisfactory smile. So once again, uh, we can do that. I think that all together, uh, we. We, we just can complete, uh, the, we have no time to, 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 to further. It will complete at 16, 534 patients. And mostly we start by MR, MS, MR, and move toward the MS recently. And the, the pre-op, you can see that uh, actually with the end result, the mitral valve opening valve area is good, more than two, and the Mean gradient is uh, below five, which is around five, which is good. And the, this is the operation that we did. And the, the 
surprisingly, with time and the understanding, you can reduce the cramp time down to about uh, 100 minutes, even with this very extremely complex pathology. And then the result is not bad. I mean, as you shown by the previous uh, session, uh, Rilke said that hospital mortality in elective should be something below than two, we achieve 1.4, let this is about eight, five cardiac and three non-cardiac. The readmission due to the heart failure, usually when we uh, examine, uh, we know that they, they take too much salt food and then we get some diuretic, usually it's good. The Coumadin overdose is often in nine patients. Severe MR occur in six, and this is it is of the, uh, to analyze the techniques that we employ. And the reoperation occur in uh, 12, we do MVR in eight, we do MV re-repair in four. This is due to technical error, rupture of the some suture that we can see obviously and make a re-suture on that. So our decision making, at least in our institution is that uh, we will try our best to repair in these four group patients, the young patients, the need to have the pregnancy, the love to have baby, and the poor compliance for medication. I mean, the dangerous to put in the mechanical valve, and healthcare system that live too far away. Uh, one, one visit, they ask six, we give six months, if it's not, if it's too long, they ask for one year. One INR test for one year is too much. We try our best to repair. But uh, the elderly with complex pathology, or uh, the, the valve that is too severe with high comorbidity, I think that we go ahead, uh, change the valve with bar prosthesis. It should be more justified. And then the limit is that. I think to summarize our limit is that the scope of rheumatic repair has been increased through the year of practice and understanding of the mitodynamic and improve of the technique. And the limitation has been reduced. So the key surgical strategy that I would like to send the message is that to correct both the diastole and systole and stepwise approach, it's just like the car assembly. You just do that at the end you got the car, is that you, you need to do the commissurotomy first because this is allow you to assess the movement. Fan shape, trying to restore the fan shape cord. And then the MR is due to, due to restriction of the cord. So resection of any restrictive cord is mandatory. And start at the posterior first before the anterior because you can see better and you can assess the mobility better. Fitness station plus papillotomy is very helpful to restore the mobility and restore the alternative flow and can reduce the mean gradient quite a lot. Peeling is one of the key techniques that allow to restore the pliability and movement of the leaflet. And peeling of calcify leaflet is feasible and safe to do. And choice Choose of the appropriate valve ring is the key to achieve the, the role of the ring in this mitral uh, valve repair. So conclusion to go on valve repair is to restore both and calcification disturb mobility and geometry of the mitral valve. Leaflet mobility is important. Uh, the technique used to restore is so important and have been done in a very good way. Effective tools box for rheumatic mitral valve repair are now available for reliable repair. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, Tawasak. Uh, questions? Nice presentation. This is bravery. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question about the use of the ring. If you have essentially, in this complex case, because in simple cases you don't use, I presume, 
if you just have mitral stenosis, no or no significant mitral regurgitation, do you still use a ring? No, and yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, if uh, if you use a ring, what about uh, the type of ring? Uh, if you use the rigid, very classical rigid ring or a semi-flexible uh, physiotype ring? I think that's a van very important question about using the ring in the mitral stenosis. As I told you that uh, there's something that uh, happened to the mitral stenosis. Usually the subvalve, the, the cause is thick and shortened. It's involved primary, secondary, or tertiary. And that's, we have to restore it back by cutting valve. Now we now understand that the cause of the mitral valve defects are three types. Primary is secondary and tertiary, all have primary role. The, the primary cause is just to bring the level. It's just like a rocket ring. And then the second cause is to hold the tension during the systole. So there's, it's become thick and, and stronger. And then basal is to stabilize the annulus in the good geometry. Now we cut it off. That means we cut the support of the leaflet. That's why we need to strengthen, compensate it back by have a good craftation longer so that it can reduce the stress upon the primary cord. So I think that's why. In long term, putting in the ring had the better long term result because it compensates of the stress upon the primary cord. This is one thing. Second thing is that in rheumatic, the deformity of the anus is real, is twisted. Sometimes even we measure the length is okay. The test is it's low. No, because it's twisted us in a different way. Only after we put in the ring that is good enough to restore the geometry, then it works. So the type of the ring comes. If it's too severe, very strong, very rigid, very de de rigid ring of Kapongde is the best to me. If it's not, then semi-rigid, it works because it still maintains some mobility. But the band in rheumatic, for me, I think is a little bit risky because uh, it's, it's less supportive. This is my point of view. Uh, Dr. Tuisa, uh, in, in some cases, uh, the, the calcium and the fibrosis is limited at the only at the rough zone. And sometimes at the body and the smooth zone, it is very thin. So in this kind of case, how 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 we can remove how can we remove the at the rough zone only because we cannot peel from the yes. uh, smooth zone or, or you just leave it no I, in the in the beginning I leave it which is not good now I I, I, I use something like this this is a chafing you see the hand <laughs> it's just chaff using the very sharp bread just chaff chaff. A few times it's cool. Change it. I used to change about 20 blades. So that we, it means cut, 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 and go. And become smooth. And then it become better. Then we have to use that sometimes. Yes? Dr. Wasak, it seems that, uh, I mean, congratulations, because uh, we come from, uh, it's, it's a long way to where you are. But it seems that in your strategy, you seem to avoid as much as possible to use pericardium. Um, whereas pericardium would be a very good tool. Uh, you can imagine that you would uh, make things much easier if you would replace acute lymphad. And if you replace the posterior lymphad with pericardium and use cortex to fix it, this would uh, improve that. Why, why do you try to avoid the use uh, of pericardium more, more extensively? Yeah, that's a great question. I used to do something like that. I chop it out, put it in the patch, a lot of cortex. This work. It works better it's anterior, posterior, it works. Now, you begin to think about the young people, the young people who have to live longer, unlike the degenerative Apollo, and they have to, to live long. So we begin to think about the thickening of the pericardium, about the, the glowing of the heart, of the cortex, sort of thing like that. So we actually, we do not deny the role of pericardium 
or Gothic at all. It's a great thing. Only if we can find some alternative that we can avoid the use of this kind of thing in the young, in the <laughs> something that may be some added armamentarium for us to do the whole job. If it's there, oh, it's very easy. Just shove it out, and then we don't think too much because the long term is good. But we don't know really in the young. And so we try this way. I'd like to compliment you also on the quality of your, your surgery. That was really very beautiful. And uh, in the, the, there are those that would say, based on older data, that the valve can be repaired, but the reoperation rate's higher. But I would refer them to Professor O'Curry's paper that shows that if one corrects all of the physiology, including the submodular apparatus, that in fact the outcomes are as good as with degenerative disease. Um, I uh, like your concept of uh, sticking with native tissue uh, because the pericardium always degenerates. And we would put a patch of pericardium in the posterior leaf, and then if it calcifies, fine. You know, it's mainly a buttress, but in fact, if you could use native leaflet, you're even better off probably. Um, I just presented a, a little small video and paper at the SDS looking at mitral annular calcification. And we frequently use the ultrasonic aspirator to resect mitral annular calcification uh, and resect just enough so it will conform to the ring uh, and allow us to do a standard repair uh, very simply. And the other place that we use it is in developing the commissures in a rheumatic case like this. Uh, and I would um, suggest that you try that, the Cusa device or Sonopet, yes. uh, and because the, the, uh, the, the ultrasonic aspirator can actually find that commissure perfectly where it's very difficult. To, you have to be um, you or David Adams to find it with an 11 blade. The, the aspirator makes it very simple. So that's something I, for your toolbox that I'd recommend you try and see if you like it. Thank you very much. Yes, definitely I will think about that. Simplify. Yes. Uh, Chuck, um, this is Richard Kojo. I'd like to congratulate your uh, long-term effort to challenge the most difficult valve to repair, which is the rheumatic valve, and then your uh, long-term efforts to train and then the surgeons uh, really appreciate your long-term um, challenges of this area. I have the same uh, feeling with Patrick. Uh, you used to say that the, the calcium part is going to be cut it off and think about later, but uh, today's uh, presentation, <laughs> I feel you try to preserve even the calcified uh, regions as much as possible. And then, uh, of course, the pericardium is a uh, good tool, and I use the pericardium for the degenerative disease and then the ischemic mitral reverse and then even uh, rheumatic. And uh, my feeling is uh, the longevity of the pericardium is worse in the rheumatic and uh, much, much better in the degenerative and yeah. then the um, dysfunctional um, mitral valve repair. Is that the reason why you try to you know, minimize the use of the uh, mitral valve pericardium? Yeah, we, because uh, we, we used to use the pericardium in aortic excision, cast extension, re replacement, and rheumatic. And it become about a few years coming with thickness, with very thick deform. So we begin to think about the mitral. If we can avoid that, we can we should. But uh, if we can't, then we use it. Then I have no objection at all, but uh, trying to develop the technique that may provide us with some more additional armamentarium to tackle the problem according to the situation of the age pathology nicely so that we can, can be more practical to do that. That's all my idea. And I think it's important for us to understand now that pericardium always degenerates whether it's aortic repair or mitral repair, it always degenerates. Now, one can say that as a, as a gusset in the posterior leaflet that 
you really just need a baffle for the anterior leaflet to coact against, and that, if necessary, that can be done. It should never be done for the anterior leaflet. Um, and because if it calcifies in the anterior leaflet, then the mobility of the leaflet is impaired, and the patient will come back to redo surgery. I, I had a case that was a, a congenital uh, uh, AV canal that came back at age 30 with inadequate anterior leaflet, and I put a nice patch in it and did a case report and all that, and, you know, six years later, the lady's back with a calcified uh, cardio patch having to have a redo. So uh, I think you're exactly right to be very careful about pericardium. You use it if you have to, but, you know, be careful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so my name is Aubrey Almeida. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon from Melbourne. Uh, Tawasak gave me this uh, topic to speak about. Um, and so let's see if we can uh, be a little bit uh, controversial. Um, I really hate talks where someone says, what's the gold standard? Because the reality is nowadays, one, we don't use gold as a standard. And two, what are we really talking about here? Are we talking about stenotomy versus some form of minimally invasive surgery? Is that stenotomy versus a partial stenotomy? Stenotomy versus a right thoracotomy? We know we can do things with a, a thoracotomy versus a videoscope, direct vision, 3D videoscopy, or robotic surgery of some form or another. And when you ask dumb questions, by and large, you get dumb answers, and usually, the dumber the question, the dumber the answer. And that's what a lot of our discussions have been around. Um, I come to a lot of conferences and one person will tell me, I use this technique all the time. Someone else will say, well, you know, I do this and it's better. And the reality is I don't think that discussion gets us very far. And why is that? Well, the reality is most of the evidence we have is of poor quality. It is impossible to do a randomized trial of cardiac surgery. Because really what we're talking about is one surgeon's results versus another surgeon's results with a technique that they've developed by and large over a period of many years. And we all know that, that like in the matrix, it's not a matter of taking a blue tablet or a red tablet um, because in surgery, you can't do that. It might be fine to do a randomized control study of, of a medication, but we even know within those trials, there's significant impact on, on a number of factors. So randomized trials in surgery are, I believe, virtually impossible. But what are the sort of smart questions that we could ask, perhaps, to get some smart answers? I guess the fact is, how can you achieve the best outcome for your patient in the long term is probably the most important question that we should be asking. If then you can achieve the best outcome in the long term, and you can do that with a quicker recovery, then you are probably doing your patient a service. The other question you should be asking yourself is, when shouldn't I be doing this? Because, you know, anyone who tells me I always do this, I immediately switch off because, you know, anyone who always does one thing or other is probably not the person you should be listening to. And I think perhaps a fourth question that we should be asking ourselves, and I certainly should be asking myself, if someone else is getting excellent results doing something, how can you as an individual learn from them to achieve the same results? So what's not a question? What's not controversial? And Patrick's spoken about this, and, uh, and we all know this. At the end of the day, we want no mitral regurgitation, we want no mitral stenosis, and we want a durable repair that's gonna last the patient. Um, lifetime. And again, not telling you anything controversial, we want a good coaptation surface, we want the valve to effectively seal itself because that's what it does in nature, 
the pressure across a mitral valve when it's sealed is zero. The leaflets collapse to each other and seal themselves. We want low stress on the repair so that the, the tissue is not going to be feeling those forces. And of course, we don't want any SAM. And what are the principles that I use for those repairs? It's really no different from anyone else, which, but perhaps this is a way of thinking about it. You want to balance the surface area of the anterior and posterior leaflet, remembering in the native valve, they're exactly the same. You don't want any prolapse, and you really don't want to have any restriction if you can avoid it. You want the, the leaflet to collapse well away from the LV outflow tract, and by and large, pick an annuloplasty of some description based on the size of the leaflet, but also the size of the ventricle. And always consider the leaflet area and leaflet volume. And this is the recurring theme that you've heard from all of the speakers so far today in this mitral, mitral session this morning and now. But the other thing I think that's really controversial is, and I don't know what's happening in the rest of the world, but in Australia, on a recent review of our national database, which includes all public hospitals and almost all private hospitals, there are only five surgeons in Australia doing more than 20 mitral valve repairs a year for degenerative disease. And as you go up from 5 to 10 to 15 to 20, that rate of repair maxes out at 80%. What's interesting is there is one surgeon in Australia who does around 40 mitral valve repairs a year, oh sorry, 40 mitral operations a year for degenerative disease. This is purely degenerative disease, by the way, who has a 50% repair rate. So he replaces 50% of the valves, yet he's still getting referrals to do the operation. So how do we address these issues? Now, my talk was robotic mitral valve repair, so I better show you some pictures about robotic surgery and how we do it. Well, we've been doing this for quite a long time, for the last 16 years or so, and we use femoral cannulation for the venous and arterial. Uh, I do it the old-fashioned way with a small incision, but uh, certainly other techniques of direct uh, or percutaneous work perfectly well. We always put a neckline in percutaneously, and we use a small working port and the Da Vinci system. You can see here that once the robot's in, there's not much room to, to do anything else, uh, but certainly uh, as the, the, the bedside surgeon's role in helping set up the operation and maintain the operation is critical. Here I am sitting at the console um, doing the operation, but the real beauty of this system is that we have a second console, so in terms of training, it's actually very good. So my trainee can sit at the console, uh, do parts of the operation, I can hand over an instrument to them, I can point out various things. So in fact, educationally, in terms of teaching mitral valve repair, I can see a huge advantage in this sort of system. And at the end of the, the case, you can look at the clock there, it's 11.15 in the morning, we normally start at 8.30. Um, so this can be done in reasonably prompt time and it is our routine. So we would frequently do two or three robotic cases on, on a schedule list without any great difficulty. Those drain tubes are, are 24 French, so they're, they're eight millimeters. So we're looking at a, a working port, which is around two and a half centimeters. Um, so, you know, yes, you can do it. You can do small incisions and you can do a good job. But is there any real advantage of using a robot over other, other pieces of equipment? or a robot over direct access or a robot over videoscopy? I don't know. Um, but I will give you this case and see what you think about this. So this is a 52-year-old man who had been in the US uh, on work a, a few months earlier uh, and was unwell. He was well diagnosed with bacterial endocarditis at that time, had mild martial regurgitation and was managed medically. He got better, but now, has no evidence of endocarditis, but class two symptoms of heart failure with severe mitral regurgitation, a destroyed P1, flail P2, and a thickened and restricted A2. He was scheduled for a mechanical mitral valve replacement in Perth, and if those of you don't know the geography of Australia, Perth's the other side of the continent, so it's the same as, as LA to New York. Um, and so he was scheduled for, for the mitral valve uh, replacement, and just happened to live next door to a patient that I had operated on and somehow came to see me for an opinion. So this is his valve. Um, this is the anterior leaflet. You can see that it's really quite thickened. There's a lot of scarring on the leaflet. 
but what we're able to do is uh, using techniques that we use for rheumatic valve disease on, on this patient, we're doing a peel of his anterior leaflet. A little bit different from a rheumatic repair though, what we want to do is we want to unfurl the free edge of the leaflet. So want, not only do we want to increase the length of the leaflet, we want to incre increase the lateral extent of it. So that's what we're doing here, gradually peeling off that, little by little, exposing more and more leaflets, freeing up the, the, the uh, leaflet to allow it to unfold. And you can see underneath there is entirely normal leaflet tissue. We do that for the anterior leaflet and then we go to the posterior leaflet. You can see a lot more scarring and thickening of the posterior leaflet, gradually peeling that tissue away and mobilizing the whole posterior leaflet. So you get normal tissue underneath there. And you can see really we're left with a flail area of P2 where the endocarditis has damaged the leaflet doing a pretty standard technique of a triangular resection because there was extra leaflet tissue in that area and it was destroyed so I didn't want to put cords into it and a pretty straightforward standard repair uh, with repairing the leaflet. I tend to use for these sort of patients uh, an annuloplasty band so this is one of the Taylor bands so we put it in as a ring and then we cut off the, the bit in the middle and you can see a highly satisfactory mitral valve repair. So that's uh, you know, a, a little bit of an interesting case. So, I, as I said, I've been doing this for around 15 years now, done around 500 cases for degenerative mitral regurgitation with a repair rate of 99%, three unplanned replacements in the early experience. I must say I haven't actually had to replace a, a valve for several years. In our first 50 cases, we did have some significant complications. Um, we had a mortality in a patient I probably should have never operated on, a couple of minor neurological events of TIAs and a compartment syndrome from cannulating the femoral artery too low well before we understood some of the issues around uh, peripheral cannulation. The transfusion rate runs at around 15% uh, red cell for red cells and about 7% for non-red cells and about 1% reoperation rate for bleeding and three patients we've converted to sterotomy out of the, the 500. We've had six reoperations at a, at a five year mark for moderate MR and hemolysis, recurrent severe mitral regurgitation, and one of those was due to SAM. Again, all learning experience, probably nothing to do with the robotic operation. But how does that compare to mitral valve surgery in Australia? Again, from our database, there's a one to 2% mortality varying year to year, stroke rate of one to 2% for open surgery, reoperation rate of 5% for bleeding, a 50% transfusion rate and a 25% non-red cell transfusion rate. So when people start talking about gold standard and saying, you know, this is uh, a new technique and, you know, it really needs to match up against what you can do for astronomy, we have to be careful that we're actually achieving the best we can. We've had a look at our patients uh, at uh, comparing our open cases uh, with robotic cases, but again, these aren't my open cases, they're someone else's. So again, we're comparing surgeon against surgeon. We do know it takes longer in the operating room by 18%. It spends, patients, however, despite that longer time uh, in the operating room and longer time on bypass, has spent less time in intensive care and less time in hospital. We've had a look at what happens to them after they uh, leave hospital also. And while a robotic operation which by the way, this includes every single pair of gloves, every suture, includes every single cost of, of the robot apart from buying the equipment. A robotic operation costs $600 more, this is Australian dollars. But if you look at the term recovery time and cost to the society, in fact, uh, in the first month, a robotic operation is actually cheaper. On the other hand, replacing a, a valve, especially in a young patient when you're putting a mechanical valve in with a lifelong cost of warfarin, or Coumadin uh, is a significant cost as well, which always need to be factored into how we think about things. So what are the advantages as far as I see them? Well, clearly a nice small skin incision without us, um, it's not in the midline, is a nicer cosmetic result. You can't get a sternal wound infection, which certainly can happen with open mitral valve surgery. We clearly have shorter hospital stays and recovery times with patients getting back to normal at around the, the three to four week mark. 
And certainly in my experience, I think using this sort of equipment allows me in certain situations to do quite complex mitral valve repairs that I would find difficult using uh, non-robotic uh, mini uh, thoracotomy techniques. But what are the limitations? You know, what are the patients we shouldn't be doing? Annular calcification is a real problem and in my personal experience I think you know, these are the patients where you need to handle the calcium. Scott's idea about um, uh, of using the cruiser I've used and in certain situations with minimal calcium uh, that's excellent and allows you to put an annual plasty ring in. For someone like this with this extensive degree of, of calcium uh, I use the technique that uh, Dr. Gardner taught me with the uh, on-block resection um, and then reconstruction, um, as you can see in this case, with, with a huge amount of annular calcification. I don't do patients who have aorta iliac disease. I generally don't do patients with a coronary disease. Having said that, I do have a, a series of 10 patients who've had PCI to an isolated lesion and then six weeks later go on to minimally invasive surgery. I think we should avoid patients who have very poor left and right ventricular function because the longer cross clamp time and the longer bypass time is a real factor in those patients. And clearly patients who've had previous uh, chest trauma or pleurodesis, one needs to minimize that risk. There are significant limitations though. The system cost is real. Um, and you know, while it can be amortized against other, other units, et cetera, um, it's a real cost. The disposables cost money, uh, and you know there really is a significant learning curve, not just with the robotic equipment, but with the whole process of minimally invasive surgery. And we've got around a lot of these things by having a dedicated team. I have the same anesthesiologist, the same bedside surgeon, the same small group of nursing staff, the same technician for every case. And that's not possible in many centres. What are the things that we need to do better at? Well, I think the cost certainly will come down with more competition and there are at the moment three to four robotic systems around the world to compete with the uh, Da Vinci system and I'm sure that will bring the cost down. Flexible instruments would be valuable. I, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about tactile feedback. Um, it would be nice to have tactile feedback only for when you can't see your instruments. The reality is if you can see the instruments in your field of view, you think you can feel the tension. That operation I showed you, peeling the leaflet, uh, is entirely possible without any um, tactile feedback because of the visual feedback that you get. Uh, but having said that, once that instrument is outside of your visual field, if you're not paying attention to the instrument, you can cause a heck of a lot of damage uh, with a robotic arm um, when it skewers tissue, etc. And how do we improve the setup time to make sure that these operations can go as efficiently as possible. So ro robotic surgery, robotic mitral valve repair is mainstream. Is it the gold standard? Well, I'm not sure, but personally I think that's a little bit of a dumb question, so I'm not, not unhappy that I haven't been able to answer it. What I can say is you can use the same repair techniques, whether that's cords, uh, resection, um, stripping, uh, anything you like, apart from managing heavy calcification. The thing I can tell you is though that to have a successful program you must understand the mitral valve and how to repair it. Owning a robot doesn't make you a mitral valve surgeon. And the other thing that I think I've learnt over the years is that the teamwork is critical. I can't do this operation by myself but I am a pretty good team player and I can work with my team well. If you can't work with a team and you're not a team player you probably shouldn't be doing a robotic mitroplasty. Thank you for your attention. I've left you all speechless. Very nice presentation, all three. I think it's uh, very clear. Uh, I would like to ask you, what is your strategy for a certain group of patients that you didn't talk about, which are the elderly patients, the patients above 80, 80 plus? Do you think that they are a contraindication to do mitral valve through robotic surgery, or do you think that on the contrary, those are the best candidates and they will be a proportionally beneficial? So, so we have no age cutoff. 
um, and the uh, eldest patient I've done is uh, 90, um, and we have a significant number uh, in, their, in their 80s. Um, and in, in fact, they do very well. And I think for those patients, anything that uh, gives them a quicker recovery I is great. Having said that, you know, I'm continually astounded how well older patients tolerate a stenotomy as well. You know, they're the patients who tell me they don't have any pain and they get up and going as well. So um, I, I, I think um, I, I approach the, the patient firstly is what's their mitral valve pathology? How am I going to manage this? And then secondly, is there any reason that I shouldn't do a robotic operation? Um, I must say in the old days, I used to push to do a robotic case on, on everybody I could. Um, and, and that's entirely reasonable. Now my approach is if I think that there is any extra risk with doing it minimally invasively, I, I, I won't do it minimally invasively. But having said that, that's very few patients. Um, and, um, you know, I, I would say of my practice of those patients who uh, isolated mitral valve repair, um, might be one patient or two patients every year who I would say, no, um, I think we'd be better do this operation as an open procedure. Yes, in Malaysia. Uh, professor, that is, that is outstanding results in the robotic mitral valve repair. And that is a breathtaking picture up there. You should see it from the audience point of view. I, I guess that's you in the red jacket up there. That is uh, it's me behind the camera. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's actually uh, looking at, uh, at uh, Everest, yes, so hiking trip last year. Uh, my question is um, support for surgeons who want to start doing robotic mitral valve. I heard that Intuitive uh, no longer supports cardiac surgery, and uh, what do you think the impact is of the company itself not supporting cardiac surgery cases? for uh, surgeons who want to start doing a robotic mitral valve program? So um, in Australia, um, the Da Vinci system is through a, um, an agent, so it's not directly through intuitive surgical. Um, so we, I still proctor and, and I'm still supported by the company to, to do those cases in terms of, um, you know, arranging travel, et cetera. Um, what we do is that um, I will, um, have people come to my unit and observe cases. Um, and I insist that that includes the anesthesiologist and the nursing staff. Um, and then um, I will proctor a minimum of three cases. And my undertaking with the, the team that I'm, I'm training is that if I think we need to do more uh, than three, that um, they need to trust my opinion that I need to do more than three. Um, I think we've come a long way in that when I first started doing this, the whole concept of peripheral cannulation, strategies around myocardial protection for minimally invasive surgery, et cetera, were very much unknown. You know, people were, you know, this 15, 20 years ago, all these things were, were pretty way out. What's interesting is when I look at our learning curve, in fact, the learning curve to use the equipment is the shortest part of the learning curve. You can pick up using the equipment very, very quickly. The learning curve around the other factors is actually harder. Um, and how to teach people how to do a good mitral valve repair, how to teach people how to conduct bypass and myocardial protection uh, in a safe strategy, when to bail out, um, all those things are, are a much more complex uh, thing to teach and they're much harder to learn. Um, and I find quite often when I'm training people in robotic surgery, I'm not actually tra training them in robotic surgery at all, I'm training them in, in all the other things. Um, um, so that, that, that's a, it's difficult. Other questions? Excellent, left his picture, thank you. Thank you. So uh, Scott and I are playing tag here, so my name's Scott Rankin and Scott's going to be talking us, uh, to us today 
about um, uh, ablation or atrial fibrillation. Thanks, Scott. Well, thank you, and I, I would like to uh, say to the society how appreciative I am of, of being invited. Um, and today I'll be talking about the survival benefits of surgical ablation for atrial fibrillation concomitant to coronary artery bypass grafting and uh, how it, the implications for the guidelines. Now, atrial fibrillation on the left is probably initiated by triggers in the pulmonary veins in most patients, but then uh, maintained by rotors in large areas of the uh, left atrium, right atrium, as shown on the right. Uh, and it requires both to, to have uh, uh, sustained atrial fibrillation. Now, Jimmy Cox uh, should be given credit for uh, defining uh, the technique to, uh, to treat this with the maze operation. And I've been sort of peripherally involved with this since my youth, uh, since I was three years behind Jimmy at, in medical school at Tennessee and three years behind him as an intern at, at Duke and three years behind him on the faculty at Duke and have watched this develop. And he should, uh, he's really done a great thing with, uh, with this uh, procedure. I, I had a, uh, a robotic uh, maze about uh, four months ago, and I, I'll tell you, it's really spectacular uh, how well it works. And the concept, of course, is that if one can uh, develop a, a, a maze pattern for electrical induction through the atrium, you eliminate areas that can act as rotors and, uh, the, and then isolate the pulmonary veins so that any triggers uh, don't get released into the atrium in general. Uh, we generally do a standard Cox maze four, uh, and you can see the lesion set on this uh, um, on this uh, illustration. We've pretty much gone to uh, binatrial cryo maze, as uh, Larry Way from our group presented at the STS this year, uh, and that has several advantages uh, in terms of uh, efficiency and speed at the operation. And, uh, and we're getting ready to put our data together. They're pretty spectacular long-term with biatrial cryo maze, but um, uh, it probably should be done for uh, most uh, cases. I can't see this, um, it's too small. I wonder how I can increase the size of this uh, down here. Okay, well, uh, this is the, um, I have to say I'm a big fan of robotic surgery. I haven't had it myself, a mitral end, tricuspid repair, and it's going to be good this spring to get out and chop wood uh, and lead my normal life. That'll do fine. That's great. Thank you. We put together the 2017 AFib guidelines uh, a few years ago, and it was pretty clear when we reviewed all the information there that uh, atrial fibrillation was effective in, re in reducing the incidence of uh, uh, ablation, reduce the incidence of atrial fibrillation. This is the FAN study uh, showing 16 different randomized trials, and in all of them, there was a significant reduction in atrial fibrillation uh, long-term uh, during concomitant surgery, uh, usually in mitral valve surgery. So we were pretty, uh, we felt pretty confident in, in recommending that as a, as an indication uh, for ablation. Uh, but then the question is, uh, how does it affect operative mortality? Uh, this is the original uh, SAINT study from St. Louis uh, showing that the operative mortality was not increased by doing ablation in Ralph Damiano's uh, group. And then Jim Gammy published this from the STS database, again showing that uh, the need for pacemakers went up, but the operative mortality was really not affected by, by doing ablation. Uh, we were doing a uh, risk model for multiple valve surgery in the STS database, and I just happened to throw in AFib and atrial ablation uh, in there as one of the covariates, and it turns out that, uh, that the, ap 
that the use of uh, ablation in patients with multiple valve disease and atrial fibrillation reduced uh, operative risk by about uh, 14 percent. So uh, that I thought we were on to something there. And then my partner, Vinay Badwar, went on to do this uh, study in the STS database of all the cardiac surgery patients uh, using propensity matching. And you can see the two groups, the distribution curves of the two groups uh, uh, in AFib for all types of cardiac surgery. Uh, and in blue and yellow, ablation, no ablation. And, the, uh, and there was a, a statistically significant reduction in operative mortality by about 8%. Uh, interestingly, uh, when we looked at this data, these data, the uh, incidence of ablation was increasing dramatically in the United States. But the one group that still had a very low ablation rate were the coronary bypass patients in, in atrial fibrillation. Uh, so we then went on to look at uh, patients with uh, mitral valve repair and replacement. And in fact, when compared to the patients that had no ablation, uh, had no atrial fibrillation, if the patient had atrial fibrillation, the operative mortality rate was 15% higher. And if the patient had um, a, um, an ablation, that was reduced by about 50%. So again, it was about an 8% reduction in operative mortality. Now looking at long-term mortality, the first study was from the European Registry, um, and they showed in that patients that achieved sinus rhythm after ablation had a significant improvement in long-term uh, survival. And uh, I think this was the first landmark study. Uh, the next one was from uh, Dr. Malazari's group at Northwestern with Rick Lee as the first author. Again, a propensity match study showing patients having ablation in blue versus those not in red had uh, a significantly increased long-term survival if they were converted to sinus rhythm. And then uh, Pat McCarthy went on and looked at the patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and, in fact, saw the same thing, that uh, paroxysmal AF is not innocuous and if left untreated uh, in red, the outcomes are not as good as if the patient had ablation. In fact, in the STS database, everything that we've looked at, the uh, persistent and paroxysmal patients have a a very similar prognosis and, and survival benefit by doing an ablation. So probably it's a little bit um, artificial to make a distinction between the two in terms of prognosis anyway. Uh, we went on to do a Medicare uh, study that was pub presented at the Euro European Association for Cardiothoracic Surgery uh, back in 16. And we looked at uh, the patients in 2013 that had coronary bypass with atrial fibrillation. And the ones that um, did not have an ablation are the dotted line on the bottom, and the ones that did are the solid line. And there was a, a very significant survival benefit of uh, having ablation in the coronary bypass population. Uh, and then subsequently, uh, the group from Poland, the Polish database showed the same thing in the coronary bypass population with a significant improvement and long-term survival with ablation in the, one, in the patients with uh, atrial uh, uh, fibrillation. So uh, these were landmark uh, studies. And then the uh, St. Louis group, again, the Wash U group, uh, published this uh, paper with a, about a third of these patients were coronary bypass patients. But again, the patients having the uh, Cox Maze 4 procedure in blue had a better long-term survival as compared to those untreated in red. And at the ATS a couple years ago then, we went on and did a two-year follow-up of our group having coronary bypass with and without ablation. And in fact, the trends continue. We're actually looking at the five-year data now. Um, and there was a 29% uh, risk, relative risk reduction by having ablation, uh, although only 17% of the coronary bypass patients in atrial fibrillation had it managed with ablation, the survival pen, uh, benefits were significant. Interestingly, the uh, operative 
cost during the index operation was about 10 percent higher in those that had the ablation, largely due to a $2,000 increase in operating room expenses from the instruments. But over the two years, uh, that outlay in, uh, in, in resources was recovered by fewer readmissions in that group. So that by two years, this 29% uh, uh, mortality reduction was uh, obtained with no increase in cost. And now that we're, we're looking at the five-year data, it will be interesting to see if the, if the cost, in fact, is less in these, in these patients. So uh, this is the Malaysia study that was just uh, presented, and, and um, uh, we think that there are uh, certain problems using the um, propensity-matched uh, technique that, that they uh, used in this. We, in fact, uh, uh, did a similar uh, type of study in the overall mitral population and, and saw a similar outcome. So I personally believe it's better to use a a Cox model, a regression analysis of the entire population rather than omitting half of the group. But we can talk about that as time goes on. So in conclusion, late survival is improved after concomitant atrial fibrillation ablation during most types of heart operations, including coronary bypass. And uh, the data support the current guidelines of performing concomitant uh, surgical ablation for atrial fibrillation in most procedural types and patient uh, categories. And in fact, we uh, are in the process right now of markedly increasing our application of ablation in the coronary bypass population uh, to uh, a maximal level. Uh, and, and it's interesting to, to look at the survival benefit of uh, ablation in the population is probably as great as that achieved by bypassing free vessel disease. So uh, it's, not, it's not a small uh, benefit. Uh, however, more studies are needed and current hypotheses uh, and uh, uh, efficacies could change as we acquire more data. So thanks again for inviting me uh, to speak today. Scott, can I uh, ask a question? Around what's the best lesion set for different patient populations. There are those people with coronary obviously there's a reluctance to do a, a, a Cox maze procedure in those as evidenced by the pulmonary vein isolation would uh, encourage surgeons to do more or do you think that doing a lesser procedure will give you lesser results? In our uh, 2013 subset of coronary bypasses here, almost certainly, if we look at the STS data bank for that period of time, 80% of the patients have pulmonary vein isolation. So those are the outcome data improvements we can see with pulmonary vein isolation. But if we look at, and there have been some more recent studies, uh, one presented at the STS this time, if we look at uh, the uh, the uh, benefits of ablation, they're always better with biatrial ablation. Even if we look at the, uh, the Northwestern series where there was no statistical benefit of adding the right atrium, in fact, there was a 5% lower uh, AFib rate long term and they just didn't have a sample size that could, could, uh, could make that statistically significant. So, we firmly believe that biatrial ablation is the procedure of choice, and with the uh, biatrial cryoablation, ablation, we're pretty much, it's a simple, quick procedure. We're using that in just about everybody. The one thing, modification that, that my partners have made, uh, uh, Vinay Badwar and Larry Way, is to be very, very careful about the placement of the superior right atrial lesions uh, so that the cryo lesion to the superior vena cava should go as far posterior as possible, and the cryolesion to the right atrial appendage should go as far anterior as possible to leave that whole central area of the, the sinus node uh, intact, and that probably uh, reduces the, the need for uh, pacemakers. 
but we really um, <coughs> don't have, um, you know, we want to re reduce pacemakers as much as possible, but in fact, uh, there was a 14% incidence in the coronary bypass group that I showed you, and that was associated with an improved survival. So I think you know, we're, if we do need to put a pacemaker in, we're not too upset, but uh, uh, the bitral cryo ablation is our procedure now that we do it just about everybody. Patrick? I have two basic questions for Mr. Hancock. One is about uh, atrial fibrillation. There are different types of atrial fibrillation. Let's talk just about uh, paroxysmal and permanent. Do what you showed us apply in the same way to, to persistent or permanent and to paroxysmal uh, ablation? And my second question is, what do you recommend as a strategy for the left appendage? Well, uh, in the... Um the uh, CMS Medicare data in the coronary bypass group that I showed you, all of those patients were required to have had AFib documented a year before they had the surgery. So they were all persistent patients. Uh, but when we look at the STS database, we can't see a difference between paroxysmal and persistent. It looks like the adverse prognosis is the same in, in both groups. It looks like the survival benefit is the same in both groups. And, you know, my view right now is that it perhaps is a little bit artificial to differentiate between the two. They both certainly should have, um, should have uh, ablation. Uh, the, um, uh, I, I, we, we need to do more studies in the future and when we do more Medicare linkages in the STS where we can look at it better long term, we may be able to differentiate that, but certainly that's what the Northwestern group showed too. Appendage, appendage yes. Well, we, we uh, oversaw the atrial appendage from inside with a double layer um, uh, running suture line. And you know, Vinay was early on atrial size reduction and he does it with sutures in such a way that when he oversows it, he actually is reducing the atrial size a little bit. And so, uh, and we get long-term uh, serial echoes in those patients. We really haven't seen any canalization or any atrial, any flow into the atrial appendage. So that's just a simple, quick way to do it. Uh, and it's cost-effective and that's how, how we do it. Scott, thanks for, thanks for quoting our papers. Um, I have the, now I have the opportunity to defend the paper that's, um, uh, that you heard at AATS. I think both of us presented our papers last year at AATS, and um, the point of that SDS CMS linked paper that we presented was that over five years, there is a reduction in not only mortality, but the SDS data also showed a reduction in stroke. So you can sort of add that to the slide deck. But I really didn't get past my middle slide that showed an increased risk of 30-day mortality. It's when everyone sort of started throwing bombs at me. Um, I think you'll like the publication when it does finally come out because I took a look at the data again. And if you separate out the high chads vasc group, which we shouldn't be doing AF ablation on anyway, that um, in fact, if you looked at the normal group of patients, that 30-day mortality was decreased in the ablation group. So I think you'll like the uh, publication more than you'll like the presentation. Well, I've reviewed the paper, so <laughs> I, I've seen it. And I also wrote an editorial about it for the journal that I hope you like. But I am um, hypercritical of this trend toward propensity matching. Uh, I think it can get you into big trouble. And I think Matt Brennan caused you a lot of trouble with the way he did that study. Uh, when you only use 40% of the population to draw your conclusions from, you're missing a lot of information on both sides. Uh, and I, I, I think I took it to Frank Harrell, who in my opinion is the best statistician in the world, and he gave me a lot of points about it. But um, I think we're better off, and I suggested if you remember in the review that you also do a Cox model on it just to correlate the two. 
which you didn't do, but I, but I think it's a much better approach because you're, you're using the information from the entire population. There are problems with the Cox model too. In fact, none of these techniques of clinical research are, are perfect. They all have troubles, but, but I think the more ways we can show something, the better. But I really think this, uh, this, this technique that, um, that Matt Brennan used in this paper were, were 60, 50, 60 percent of the population was excluded from the analysis, uh, created trouble for you in the way that came out. Um, my statistician, Frank Harrell, showed me a paper that I referenced in the editorial of a bariat bariatric surgery paper where they um, just looked at only 10 percent of the population in the middle and showed no effect of the bariatric surgery. In fact, in the overall group, there was a huge effect, but you can take out, you know, the, the periphery of the patient risk and, and get a very uh, skewed uh, uh, look at the information. And, and uh, so I, I think we can disagree scientifically about things like that. And the next thing to do is to go to the next analysis and have a look at it again. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Hiro Yamaguchi uh, from Tokyo. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation and the showing the importance of doing the maze operation in the coronary and the others. Um, I want to ask why the surgical ablation improved the long-term or short-term or long-term outcome. Probably recall the same question, but uh, I think one of the effect of maze operation to improve the long-term outcome is to decrease the stroke and also decrease the heart failure due to the uh, tachycardia-induced mechanism. Um, I have been very aggressive to do the maze operation in the last 15 years. I did the maze operation without performed without the pre-exclusion, which means uh, if patient had AF for coming to the heart surgery, do the maze operation for all. I did uh, 4, 000, roughly 4,000 4, operations. Out of them, the 22% had AF and then performed more than 900 maze operations. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found that if we do the proper maze operation, including the left atrial appendage, even they, cons uh, they had recurrent uh, AF after surgery, they did not have a stroke at all. Yeah. Of course, uh, restoring the sinus rhythm is, of course, additional or more benefit for the surgery. But even they had AF after surgery, they're gonna, they didn't have a stroke, which suggesting the left, left atrial appendage maneuver is very important component of the maze operation that contributes to the improving the long-term outcome after maze. What do you think about it? Yeah, we agree with that, that it's part of the operation. That uh, atrial appendage obliteration is part of the, is, is part of the maze operation, and uh, uh, in, in you know if we look at operative mortality, it is slightly decreased by eight eight percent relative uh, risk reduction is not that much, but it's there when we look at a large population, and we can all think back the patient that we operated on and then they had a stroke four days post-op or something like that if we, with atrial fibrillation or they have a marginal low cardiac output in the ICU whereas with sinus rhythm it might have been fine and they move right along so I think there are early benefits for sure and uh, long term uh, the benefits are much, much greater uh, and I'll tell you I'm glad I'm in sinus rhythm now you know I mean uh, that I was really in trouble with that uh, with that atrial fibrillation. I'm running three miles a day now, so uh, yeah, I believe in it. If that's true, I think uh, we have to um, address the importance of the left atrial maneuvers. Yeah. Not only doing the PV isolation um, for the um, during the surgery. Right. When we looked at the uh, STS database of the patients that had ablation, 85% had a left atrial appendage obliteration. It might have been higher than that, frankly, and maybe in the, some of the 
patients that was just left off, but uh, you know, it certainly should be 100%. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, that's, uh, we'll conclude the, uh, the session. I'd like to thank uh, the speakers and uh, the audience for their participation. Um, and we'll reconvene uh, after lunch for the next session. Thank you.